Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Heidi Stroud-Watts in Sydney, where markets have just come online. I'm Annabelle Drawlers in Hong Kong. We're counting down to Asia's major trading opens and our top stories this hour. Asian stocks may get a boost from Wall Street's record close, but strong US hiring is testing bond traders' faith that Fed rate cuts are on the way. China is pledging to stabilise its markets after shares sink to a five-year low, but officials offer no specifics on ending the sell-off. Plus, Middle East tensions hit new highs after a wave of US-led strikes in Iraq, Syria and Yemen. And kicking off with that story this morning, Heidi, because we've got Brent crew, WTI, both of these coming online. Uh, you're seeing just some very muted gains here at the start of trade. Now, that is in the context, though, of the Friday close. We saw both contracts falling into the red. What is driving that is just this general recalibration around supply versus demand concerns. But from the supply side, it's, it's down to Middle Eastern tensions and uh, as you said these those really ratcheted up over the weekend but uh, what we had was the latest US and UK forces striking dozens of sites in Yemen against Iran-backed Houthi militants were getting that vow to respond and then separately as well we had the earlier strikes against Iran-linked militias in Iraq and Syria uh, as well so that's really playing into the dynamic here. Uh, what else we're tracking though because let's take a look at how US futures are coming online this morning and we did have that Friday day close. Very, very, very strong day for Wall Street here. We're not seeing too much movement yet, but just look at the levels that you see for the S&P 500 contract there, because we are approaching that 5,000 mark. It's already trading as well at a record high. We did have the strong U.S. jobs print, but still, that just tells us, Heidi, the U.S. economy is just so strong and powering along. And of course, it's really the geopolitical overlay that we're watching uh, that potentially complicates that broader picture when it comes to uh, that focus on central banks. And there is a focus on central banks this week, Bell, when it comes to the start of trading here in Australia. Of course, we're looking to that first meeting from the Reserve Bank of Australia, unanimously expected to keep its cash rate at three and at 4.385 percent, and probably maintain that hawkish stance. But certainly, a lot of focus and scrutiny this week will be on that revamped communications regime and what we hear from the RBA and from Governor. Uh, uh, Michelle, uh, uh, when it comes to their expectations, right? Michelle Bullock is expected to retain that hawkish position uh, with inflation still higher in the U.S. compared to what we're in Australia compared to what we see in the U.S. Taking a look at how stocks are coming online, that staggered open. And we're seeing downside of about four tenths of one percent. This, though, as we see Australian stocks really trading close to those highs of June 1992. But we have been pretty range bound when it comes to this market, uh, extending those record highs. The Aussie dollar is sitting at 65.02 at the moment. The US dollar, pretty mixed, tight ranges that we're seeing within that G10 space. Of course, after posting its best day in about a fortnight, the fifth weekly advance for the Bloomberg dollar index. So a little bit of pressure coming from that side when it comes to the Aussie dollar, but. Uh, the Aussie really closing down almost 1% for a fifth weekly decline. So we'll see if there's any kind of comeback in this week. But uh, we're watching Kiwi stocks off by just about a quarter of 1% as well. But we could see a little bit more upside as we see the rest of major markets come online. Chicago Nikkei futures up by about a tenth of a percent. Dollar yen holding pretty steady at that 148 level. And of course, continuing to look to what next for this route of sentiment in China, right? FTSE A50 China futures looking decidedly lower, seven tenths of a percent, even as the Chinese regulator uh, continues to jawbone on these abnormal market fluctuations as it's characterised. But of course, we're watching dear politics this morning in the Middle East. Iran-backed Houthi militants have promised to respond after US and UK-led forces struck dozens of sites in Yemen. A Houthi spokesman says the airstrikes will not deter the group from expressing support for Palestinians in Gaza. The Pentagon says 36 of these sites were targeted, including deeply buried weapons storage facilities and missile systems. Separately, the U.S. also conducted airstrikes against Iran-linked militia in Iraq and Syria over the weekend in response to a deadly drone attack on American troops in Jordan. U.S. officials say they struck 85 targets at seven locations linked to Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards. Iraq has warned of potentially disastrous consequences following those attacks. Well, William Wechsler is the senior director of the Rafik Hariri Center and Middle East programs at the Atlantic Council, and he joins us now. William, great to have you with us. So this latest move from the Biden administration, does it deter or does it heighten tensions? Does it perhaps do neither? Where do you see this going from here? And I know that you think that this will be a pretty uh, extended conflict. 
Yes, this conflict will go on for some time. The goal of it is to reestablish the deterrence that unfortunately had been lost in recent months. Um, whether it is successful strategically at reestablishing that deterrence will depend, of course, on the actions by Iran, Iran's partners, and Iran's proxies. They uh, will they have already made a lot of rhetorical noise, that, as one would expect, but we'll see in the weeks and months ahead whether the level of violence declines. What do you expect when it comes to diplomatic overtures, right? Because we, we would still expect these channels to be open to Tehran. We know that Iran has also signaled that it perhaps wants to de-escalate. Yes, uh, Iran doesn't want a regional war because it would lose in that regional war. The United States doesn't want a regional war because it would be devastating for the region and put a lot of U.S. interests at risk. So there is a mutual uh, uh, commonality of avoiding that most negative outcome. Now, that said, once the bombs start dropping, there's always the potential for misunderstanding, misescalation. Um, what we've seen in the past is Iran and its proxies steadily mark marching up the escalation ladder, waiting to be pushed back, and then they'll go down. That's what one would most likely expect the outcome here. How do you think relations between the U.S. and Iran are likely to shift then over the course of this year as we count down to the U.S. election? I think Iran sees 2024 as a potentially um, great opportunity for them to achieve their longstanding strategic objective of pushing the United States out of the region. They saw internal discussions uh, uh, within the U.S. government of removing troops from Syria. They know that there's public d d discussions with the government of Iraq about withdrawing troops. And of course, the overall context of this is the war in Gaza, which has uh, uh, made public uh, sentiment towards the United States go down and public sentiment towards Iran going up. So they thought that they could increase the level of violence to achieve their end. I suspect that they're actually made a mistake here and that what's going to happen is there is going to be even more firm commitment to keeping U.S. troops in the region from the rest of the year. So then... How do you think that the White House and, and both Democrats, Republicans are sort of likely to, to shape their rhetoric in response to this? Rhetoric will, rhetoric will be tough on both sides, and both sides in an election year will be competing to see who can be who can be tougher. But the most important thing that's going on right now is the diplomatic discussions of Secretary Blinken um, in the region, I believe, for the fifth time since the October 7th terrorist attack by Hamas. And what they're trying to do is to do a massive restructuring of the geopolitical um, sentiments within the region by ending or at least pausing the war in Gaza, creating a new relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia, and creating a new relationship between Saudi Arabia and Israel. That is a worst case scenario for Iran. And it and the prospect of that is one of the reasons why Hamas probably did the attack in the first place. But this is still a Biden administration key strategic objective. You know, President Biden came into office vowing to end America's forever war, right? Does this look increasingly like an issue of bandwidth? Because we already have uh, Ukraine as an issue. We already have, of course, the ongoing war in Gaza. And is this just heightening potential expectations or risks that this is going to be a broader regionalization of a, a third front? Is, is definitely raising the threat of a third front of a wider regional war. And again, that's something that both the United States and Iran don't want. Um, I do believe that the United States and its allies have the ability to both walk and chew gum at the same time. They can support the Ukrainians with, um, with a significant amount of weaponry for them to fight with. They can support Israel with what it needs to deal with Hamas. And they can protect longstanding U.S. national security interests like protection and freedom of navigation and the protection of their own people in the region from Iran and its proxies. They can do all of these at the same time. Uh, Biden of officials again head headed to the region for, I think, a fifth visit to try and broker a ceasefire. Are you optimistic at this point, given the humanitarian toll that's been taken, that any kind of uh, temporary or even more significant ceasefire can be negotiated? 
Well, there is, by all reports, a very significant deal on the table right now, um, and the, the the party to the to the conflict that has not yet accepted the deal is Hamas. Um, there's reports of divisions between those um, leaders in Hamas that are taking the brunt of the violence in Gaza and those who are political leaders living in Doha um, between whether or not they should take this deal. But the ball is very clearly in Hamas's court. They could have a very extensive uh, uh, humanitarian pause of the fighting um, tomorrow if they wanted to. All right, that was uh, William Weschler, Senior Director of the Rafa Kariri Center and Middle East Programs at the Atlantic Council there. Uh, coming up, a survey shows most Japanese firms don't see China's economy improving this year. The Japanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry in China tells us more about their findings later this hour. But first, China stabilizes, or pledges rather, to stabilize markets after local shares sank to a five-year low on Friday. We'll have more details on that ahead. This is Bloomberg. Chinese authorities are again promising support for the nation's battered stocks after Friday's market route led to an outpouring of frustration on social media. For more, let's bring in our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel in Hong Kong. And Steve, I mean, we've heard this before, but, but another pledge and, and another time that we don't really get many details on it? Sure. I think authorities had to say something. And so a statement coming from the securities regulator, the CSRC, yesterday, Sunday, essentially trying to at least put a Band-Aid or some, you know, some uh, cream on the wound, if you will, of Friday's stock market route. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, all that job owning that we heard earlier in the week petered out by Friday, and the market sank, uh, the CSI 300 sank 3.4%. Uh, there was an outpouring of, of frustration on social media, which is, which is, you know, a very narrow area to be able to voice your discontent in mm. China because it's so heavily, uh, you know, um, uh, scrutinized, obviously, and, and um, basically, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Policed. There's a good one, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's a Monday morning, so I'm yep. finding struggling with my words. Uh, so anyway, they, I think a lot of these uh, frustrated investors went to the U.S. Embassy website to voice their frustration. I don't know why exactly the U.S. Embassy, whether the U.S. had anything to do with this. But again, it's just showing uh, the, the potential for political or social instability with a stock, marking, stock market now losing about, what, $6 trillion uh, in the route. This is the sixth consecutive week of losses. Uh, and so, again, this is what the CSRC came out and vowed yesterday. Prevent abnormal fluctuations. Well, how is the big question? Yes. How are you going to prevent that? They say they will give the uh, medium and long-term funds uh, into the market, so they will provide some funds uh, into, the, uh, into the market. But again, we don't know how much. There's been a lot of talk about a market stabilization fund. Still no details on that. And then also crack down on what they called illegal activities, including malicious short selling and insider trading. But again, no details on who potentially is doing that and how it is affecting the market right now. Steve, morning, I, don't, I don't think anyone can blame you for being a bit sort of speechless, right? Because at this point, what, what else can we say? What can we say? What can authorities say or do to actually meaningfully uh, change sentiment? Yeah, well, again, there's this uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. I'm sure you've heard about them and, and, and worked with them essentially on stories. They are a government think tank. Uh, they're an advisory body to the Communist Party. Uh, but how much sway they have is yet to be really determined. They are coming out, at least the academic Liu Yuhui, saying authorities should set up a stabilization fund as soon as possible, given the market sentiment right now. Uh, this academic saying up to 10 trillion yuan. Uh, should be the sum uh, that they should target for the stabilization fund. That's 1.4 trillion U.S. dollars, including uh, between 300 to 500 billion U.S. dollars in immediate funding. Uh, and again, that academic is saying right now, 
the market stabilization is being essentially led by, quote unquote, the national team. And that means state owned enterprises and essentially directives from the central government uh, to prop up the market. And again, we had earlier last week uh, directives coming down to further limit uh, malicious short selling. So they're trying to do what they can to boost sentiment. But the bottom line, Heidi and Annabelle, as you all know, is the overall macro condition in China. Weak growth, if any, really, in many parts of China. You have simmering U.S.-China uh, problems. And the big elephant in the room is the property sector. Many investors want more concrete measures uh, coming down the pike to support the property market and potentially even a, a rate cut with the medium-term lending facilities, something to really tangibly impact a market sentiment. Tangible. That's, a, that's another good word that we'll uh, keep in our back pocket there. Chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Angle there with the latest when it comes to uh, these efforts to, to try and change the trajectory for Chinese markets, right? But take a look at oil, of course, very closely in focus, G, given the geopolitical uh, tensions and overlay that we continue to watch this morning with Uthi rebels vowing new attacks after the latest uh, US and UK led airstrikes. So we're watching that very closely, but at the moment we're seeing quite a bit of upside when it comes to Brent crew just holding pretty steady at just under 78 bucks. Uh, New York crude, they're also trading just shy of $73. Another big earnings period as well from uh, big oil in focus this week. Let's take a look at uh, energy markets a little bit more closely. The latest geopolitical uncertainties with Sue Keenan, who joins us in New York, and a lot for you know crude traders to be contending with at the start of this week. Right. This is the first time that we've seen both oil investors and traders react to the significant events late last week. And again, that's a significant significant bid we're seeing given that oil fell by the most uh, for the week since October on a number of uh, different factors I'll get into uh, when we look at just last Friday. Uh, the market had been waiting for this promised response. Uh, it had taken a moment. The U.S. military had said it would choose its own moment and timing on this. U.S. and allies targeted Houthi sites, 13 locations in Yemen. It is the biggest barrage since the initial attacks on January 11th. But as you can see in this Bloomberg chart, oil had started to decline even as this uh, response was being awaited. Uh, these attacks by the Houthis began in the Red Sea in November, prompting the Biden administration to vow retaliation along with its allies. But again, the reaction uh, results so far have been mixed, and these attacks in the Red Sea have continued, and we know the Houthis have now vowed uh, to uh, to pay back uh, the U.S. and the U.K. for its latest airstrikes. Uh, there were a number of bearish factors that pushed West Texas Intermediate and crew, uh, Brent to some extent uh, down more than 7 percent last week. Uh, there were reports of a potential ceasefire. You may remember uh, late last week that had a bearish effect. Uh, there were fresh indications that world markets were adequately supplied. That's the bigger overarching fundamental story on crude. Uh, WTI's prompt spread, that's the difference between its two nearest contracts, flipped by as much as five cents into a bearish structure known as Contango, and there was a breach of two key technicals that triggered algorithmic selling. So again, this is a you know, significant uh, turning into the green as a result of what's happened. Yeah, some big fluctuations. But what is clear, I guess, Sue, out of this is the, the way that oil is being moved around is changing out of this. Yeah, at first, many had uh, anticipated this would be a temporary disruption and it wouldn't really impact oil. But at this point, we're starting to see major shifts in the way the global oil buyers are making their purchases. Bottom line, local cargoes have become much more attractive. Uh, one ship tracking firm has come out with some pretty compelling statistics. Uh, again, we know there's been higher prices. We know there's been a slump in traffic through the Suez. And a lot of uh, ships are having to go around the tip of Africa. Across Europe, refiners have skipped purchases of Iraqi crude in favor of other types. Um, we know that uh, the crude loadings for the U.S. to Asia alone plunged by more than a third last month from December. Again, that's according to one ship tracking firm's data. Uh, that same firm tells us that oil tanker traffic from the Suez is down some 23 percent last month when compared to November. So these attacks and the uh, 
really mixed response we've seen uh, to the U.S. and U.K. Uh, countermeasures uh, have continued to really impact the oil shipping market. Back to you. Yeah, absolutely. That was uh, Bloomberg, Sue Keenan. There we'll have more ahead on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Chevron has posted fourth quarter earnings that beat the average analyst estimate with annual production hitting a record. Chair and CEO Mike Worth told us more about the results as well as its acquisition strategy. It was a year of records for us. We had record global oil and gas production of 3.1 million barrels a day, record U.S. production. And in the fourth quarter, we had record Permian production of over 870,000 barrels per day. Uh, so really strong performance in, in our business across the board allowed us to return a record $26 billion to shareholders, almost 10 percent of our market cap. And as you mentioned, uh, we raised our dividend 8 percent mm -hmm. earlier this year. So uh, strong performance, uh, you know, around the world. Permian certainly showing very strong growth and momentum as we move towards a million barrels a day in 2025. So, Mike, you mentioned on the call that you weren't going to be increasing CapEx. So I'm just wondering what your confidence level is in maintaining uh, and improving those productivity and efficiency gains. Well, capital discipline always matters in our business. And for years now, we have been uh, very uh, committed to a tight capital budget and focusing on execution. What we've done now in the Permian is we've grown to a point where uh, we'll uh, hold our CapEx as guided at about $5 billion this year and, uh, and see continued growth this year and next year. And as we get uh, to next year at a million barrels a day, we'll start to talk about holding a plateau, which allows us to actually invest even less capital in order to do that. So uh, we're very committed to uh, you know, capital discipline through the cycle. It matters in this industry. It's an industry that at times uh, hasn't necessarily exhibited that. And I think it's important that, that our company and other companies uh, remember the lessons of commodity markets. What does that mean, uh, Mike, going forward here once the acquisition of Hess uh, it closes later? Is later this year here. What type of changes still need to be made? When we, we close the deal with Hess, which is uh, expected mid-year, uh, we've got a, a fairly involved FTC uh, information request that we're in the midst of right now. Uh, we'll have a, a company that has even stronger uh, production growth further into the future. Uh, it will allow us to underpin uh, not only uh, the dividend, but also a very strong balance sheet and continued uh, share repurchases not only through the balance of this decade, but well into the next. So it takes what's a strong portfolio for us today, and it makes it even stronger for longer. And then, of course, looking at the strength in the stock, looking at the strength of the balance sheet, Mike, I'm sure you've heard the questions here. Do you plan any other major acquisitions this year? We, we just com completed one acquisition last year. We're in the midst of, of another one. And uh, we're always alert to opportunities, but integrating a company in our industry matters. Uh, we operate in uh, challenging environments. The work we do needs to be done with precision to keep people safe, to protect the environment. And integrating two companies together and all the, the things that go with that are uh, something we, we take very, very seriously. And so uh, we've, got our, uh, we've got our hands full right now. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll work hard to close the Hess deal and do a good job integrating a great company with ours. And uh, as we go forward, if opportunities present themselves, we'll certainly evaluate them. But we're not, you know, we're not feeling a need to do anything. Chevron CEO Mike Worth there speaking to Bloomberg's Alex Steele and Romain Bostic. Much more to come here on Daybreak Australia as we see Australian stocks in that first half hour of trade or not uh, significantly lower at this point. We're seeing just about every sector there in the red with materials and energy some of the biggest losers. This is Bloomberg. Wow. Wow, look, the economy is really strong. What an amazing jobs report. This is a very strong report and a strong labor market. This is an exceptional labor market. You really have to squint uh, to see the cracks in the, in the system. I do think it's a bit of a headache for the Fed. The Fed doesn't have to normalize policy as quick. March is off the table. We never thought the Fed was going to make a move in March. You are more likely to get the three cuts 
that the Fed has signaled three to four rather than the higher number that the markets has been romancing. The aggressive market pricing in of, of a lot of cuts this year are starting to come out. June is what I think should happen and what I think is likely to happen. And that this report just feeds into that. Some of our guests there on Bloomberg TV reacting to the surprise surge in U.S. jobs data. And let's discuss that now with our guest, Spencer Hakamian, founder and CIO at Tulu Capital Management. Spencer, I'm interested in your views on this number because the jobs report really does call into question this narrative around a soft landing. U.S. equities, though, they seem to like this idea that the U.S. economy is powering ahead. Bond markets are thinking otherwise around the direction for Fed rate cuts. But how did you read the numbers? I totally agree. It was a it was a massive number, and even more massive was probably the revisions that came on for the past month. Uh, and I think that this report just solidifies that March is highly, highly unlikely for a rate cut. I think that uh, eventually the futures, the bond futures market, and uh, the Fed's dot plot, we're going to meet somewhere in the middle, and we're going to get three to four rate cuts in 2024. I actually think that is a better environment for equities than the type of environment where you'd be getting six or seven rate cuts. That's a lot more uh, synonymous with a recession that would not be good for corporate profits in any way whatsoever. So uh, we think that it makes sense for the markets to like it. And especially if you know ECI was a little bit weak, if we get an inflation print that's manageable or even weak that's you know exactly what we would want you know the fed chair has always said they don't want a recession uh it, it's not a problem that corporate profits are high but the labor market is strong so it, i mean i think this is a this could be a good environment for equities going forward but it does raise the risk that we, we see a no landing sort of situation. Inflation could stay elevated. Is that still an environment that equities are going to like, even inflation, say, sticks around the 3% mark? So, you know, uh, I think one of the biggest risks that we see on this front is the fact that wages are growing between 4 and 5%. And that's inherently going to be difficult to get infl uh, inflation down to 2%, uh, especially if goods start to reinflate uh that'll be very hard for you know to get the overall inflation picture to two percent so that's why we would suggest you know even within equities to be invested in equities that are less rate sensitive to other sectors uh, that could still benefit from you know consumer from you know strong consumer but wouldn't get very negatively impacted if the fed had to you know, hold for longer or even possibly hike, although that is not our base case. It is still definitely a possibility. Spencer, how much consideration are you assigning to both geopolitical and domestic political risk this year? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, look, you can see what's happening in the Red Sea. It's something that we have to monitor closely, especially as it relates to commodity prices. And also, you know, this is the biggest election year in global history, or at least in Western history, 40% of global GDP uh, is going into an election this year. So that is something where who is at the table is going to change. And that is going to have an impact one way or another, whether, whether it be through tariffs, whether it be through you know changes in geopolitical stance. Uh, there's a variety of ways that that can affect things. So we're going to be watching that closely. Of course, we will. The outlier, of course, when it comes to uh, the central bank cycle is the BOJ. What are your expectations? And I know your expectation ends with the yen potentially at 135. How does that impact the equity rally? So, you know, take it back a second. Uh, I, I think that the BOJ has seen enough or is close to seeing enough to justify uh, exiting the, you know, the last negative rate in the whole world. And if they do that, especially if the Federal Reserve, the ECB, the Bank of England, the PBOC are all cutting, are all easing, uh, we think that is very bullish for the yen. Uh, we think that's a tailwind. Um, and we can see the yen rallying up to 135 here. Um, actually, as it were to relate to Japanese equities, we actually would see that as somewhat of a, tail, a headwind, I should say, 
similar to what you saw in the United States in late 2021. Uh, as you know, the central bank begins to hike, that is obviously a net negative to companies that are borrowing. But it's also, if it raises the price of the yen, it's going to make Japanese uh, exports more expensive, and Japan is a uh, is a pretty big exporter to the world. So, but on the flip side, it would make their imports of commodities cheaper. So it could work both ways. But we'd be a little bit cautious on Japanese equities uh, if the POJ begins to hike. I'm curious to know if you're cautious on Chinese equities because over the weekend the big headline coming out was that China regulators are pledging to stabilize markets. Do you see any sort of investment opportunities here, even from a valuation perspective? Let's talk about it from a valuation perspective. The CSI 300, the Shanghai 300 right now is uh, at 2007 prices. Now, what's happened in China since 2007? Uh, GDP has quadrupled, corporate profits have quadrupled, and the 10-year yield in China is at its lowest point at any point in these past 17 years. So purely from a valuation perspective, it is probably the cheapest that Chinese risk assets have ever been. But obviously, markets are highly, highly efficient, and things that are cheap generally happen to be cheap for a reason. As it relates to China, uh, there is the hidden debt problem, especially when you consider uh, state-owned enterprises and local government debt. That could be close to 250% of GDP by some estimates. There is the population problem. China's population declined in 2022 for the first time in 60 years. There's obviously the elephant in the room, which is any type of conflict regarding Taiwan uh, that would immediately cause a wave of sanctions from the West, and that would obviously be a negative impact to Chinese risk assets. So while it is cheap, uh, we believe there is reasons to be cheap. And for us personally to get more interested, we would like to see more forceful and direct both monetary and fiscal stimulus from the PBOC and from Beijing. So that's what we'll be waiting for on the Chinese front. Your highest conviction call, though, so is for a 210 steepness. So just talk us through that one. Absolutely. So, you know, our highest conviction call, as you said, is the two cent steepener in the U.S. Right now, the yield curve is about negative 35 basis points inverted. Uh, history strongly shows that every time the Fed cuts, whether it be three cuts, four cuts, six cuts, it doesn't really matter. As long as the Fed is cutting, the yield curve tends to normalize. And given the fact that we're starting at negative 35, we see it as having pretty good relative value. And then one step beyond that, we spoke about wages a little bit earlier. The front end of the curve has a lot less interest rate, risk premium, term premium, inflation premium. So we think that the sharp ratio or the risk reward in the front end of the curve is much better than in the back end of the curve. Uh, so we just see that uh, we see the curve normalizing probably to between 50 and 100 basis points in 24. And that would yield itself to a pretty nice return on the steepener trade. Spencer Hackman, founder and CEO at Tulu Capital Management. Great to have you with us. We do have much more ahead here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. It's time for Japan ahead on Daybreak Australia and Japanese markets set to open in about 20 minutes from now. So far, the outlook for futures today, it's uh, looking like we're going to see some gains here at the open. Now, uh, of course, put it in the context of the Wall Street session on Friday because we saw U.S. stocks powering to all-time highs. We had a strong jobs report, but that tells us that the U.S. economy is extremely strong. And so we did see that move higher for the S&P 500, nearing the 5,000 mark. But Nikkei futures looking to follow that lead from the session on Friday. And you continue to see that Japanese yen there holding fairly steady. But uh, Heidi, uh, of course, it is getting into a, a quite a significant holiday week for this region as well. Yeah, of course. Uh, Lunar New Year, of course, is almost upon us. China facing, as we enter the year of the wood dragon, a series of macroeconomic challenges following the housing slump, the weak rebound over COVID, and of course, a loss of market sentiment as we've been uh, reporting on throughout the course of the last few months. And foreign companies are becoming less optimistic when it comes to their prospects for the Chinese economy. A survey by the Japanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry in China found that over 400 companies cut their investment 
in the country last year. Masami Miyashita is the vice chairman of the chamber and joins us now. Masami, great to have you with us. And of course, I'm sure all foreign businesses operating in China are hoping for a better year in the year of the dragon, but it's looking pretty pessimistic. Mm, yes. Uh, our chamber, the Japanese Chamber of Commerce Industry in China, conducted a business survey of our member and uh, received uh, 1,700 response. Uh, business condition and uh, business perspection of our member continue to be challenging. Uh, but there has been a modest improvement compared to the previous survey. The main reason, the effect of the easing of the international situation surrounding China. Uh, so last uh, November, uh, the Japan-China summit meeting and the U.S.-China summit meeting are uh, held. Uh, this is also a good uh, reason for our uh, Japanese uh, company's uh, uh, business situation in China. The political side hasn't helped either, right? There's been various government crackdowns, there's been changes to significant things like accounting and, and auditing rules for foreign firms. How much has that weighed into the overall picture, given that we've seen the steep fall in foreign direct investment? Uh, yes. Uh, so a lot of Japanese companies in so China, uh, so now is uh, struggling in the investment in China. The, the main reason is that the uncertain outlook of the Chinese economy. Uh, in addition, the details of the anti-spirals and the data transborder the restriction are still unclear. Uh, without this improvement, it will be difficult to maintain the current business and no business of new investment will be uh, generated. I'm curious with the finding that about 80% of respondents to your survey answered that they feel that they're treated equally with Chinese companies. We spoke to the American Chamber of Commerce in China last week and, and it was quite a different response because we heard from that body that US companies were feeling increasingly less welcome in the country. So what's the difference do you think for Japanese firms instead? Yes, so a lot of Japanese companies in China so entered uh, at the uh, so 1990s and uh, top of the 2000. So uh, a lot of Japanese companies have a good relation with the local government of China. So local government China's officials uh, treated uh, so very, very care to the Japanese companies. So, uh, we uh, have a big e effect uh, from the local government uh, officials. What are the, the biggest issues, though, do you think, in terms of uh, labor costs? How, how significant is that? Uh, yes, labor cost is a very good, uh, big problem. But uh, so, uh, labor skill in China is uh, better than the uh, other countries. Uh, so in East, uh, so East Asia, uh, other East Asia or so Southeast Asia. <clears throat> so uh, Japanese company in China still continue to stay in uh, China and uh, conduct their own business. Masami Miyashita, great to have you with us, Vice Chairman of the Japanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry in China. Would you have some breaking news when it comes to this U.S. border Ukraine aid deal? Uh, an agreement has been reached, but there are some hurdles that remain. Senators have released that bipartisan deal uh, to impose new U.S. immigration restrictions to potentially unlock billions of dollars in Ukraine aid that had been held up. This is a cru crucial step, even as that measure continues to face, of course, we know long odds when it gets to the House. Senate Democratic Leader, Jack 
Schumer and his Republican counterpart Mitch McConnell both backing the $118.2 billion compromise. The Senate planning the first procedural vote on the measure to take place on Wednesday. But the GOP presidential frontrunner Donald Trump vehemently opposes it, as do many House conservatives. Uh, Schumer saying the bipartisan Senate deal is a monumental step uh, and that uh, senators must shut out that noise uh, from those who want this deal to fail for their own political agendas. This, of course, has taken months of haggling uh, by Democrats, Republicans and independents as well uh, who have reached this deal. But, of course, we could see uh, bail this still fail and House Republicans could still try to alter that deal more to their liking. We know that a lot of Ukraine supporters uh, could seek to attach that aid to upcoming funding bills that are essential to keeping the government open as well if the border issue uh, continues to, to, to head into another stalemate. Yeah, certainly something to track very closely, that, that response and the possible implications. But uh, let's shift back to Japan now because the earnings spotlight is moving to auto giants this week with Toyota, Honda and Nissan all reporting. Uh, Toyota's results will be closely watched for any impact from the recent Daihatsu scandal and comments on its lowered electric vehicle goals. Our breaking news editor, Gareth Allen, joins us now from Tokyo. And Gareth, I'm, I'm curious, let's just kick off with what you're expecting from the Japan car makers in particular. Yeah, that's right. Huge week for earnings in Japan and the car makers are going to be a, a big focus. We have Toyota tomorrow and then Honda and uh, Nissan later in the week. Uh, consensus is looking pretty strong. Uh, top line growth uh, somewhere around 20% uh, or a little under uh, and operating income level 30 to 40% growth uh, year on year according to uh, analyst consensus. So um, generally the uh, the numbers are going to look pretty good but of course um, the underlying uh, issue with uh, as you said with, with Toyota is it's uh, seemingly never ending string of scandals at its uh, subsidiaries from Hino to Daihatsu to Toyota Industries and of course Daihatsu is, is just starting to come back online with a couple of models have been recertified but they're pretty much still not uh, not operating at all so uh, yeah, we'll be watching, although Toyota has already said um, quite a lot on the matter and probably won't comment on too much more detail uh, tomorrow, um, but anything we can get on, on what the longer term impact of this is going to be is uh, it's going to be really interesting. Gareth, Gareth, a potentially really interesting week when it comes to some of the other big earnings, right? A big focus on tech for Japan mm -hmm. this week. Yeah, in terms of tech, we've got uh, Nintendo, which is always uh, always huge, and things are looking a little bit more difficult for uh, for Nintendo than it was with the uh, with the automakers. Consensus is showing they're going to have a, a, a decline in profit uh, for the third quarter. Uh, in focus for Nintendo, of course, is the uh, the the upcoming new console, uh, which is slated to be this year. So any hints we can get on when that might be and what it might look back, what it might look like, is also going to be pretty fascinating. Breaking news editor Gareth Allen there in Tokyo. And you can catch Japan Ahead every week. That's every Monday at 8.40 a.m. if you're watching in Tokyo, 7.40 p.m. on Sunday if you're catching it out of New York. Bloomberg subscribers can watch us live on the terminal as well. That's at the TV Go function. This is Bloomberg. Seoul's Central District Court is set to issue a decision today on charges against Samsung Executive Chair J.Y. Lee. He's accused of fraud in connection with a controversial merger of two Samsung Group units in 2015. Let's get uh, a preview as to what we're expecting. Our Asia Technology senior reporter Yulim Lee joins us now. So Yulim, you're watching this very closely. Uh, we don't really know, I guess, but what are some of the broad expectations? That's right. Um, this, this case goes back to 2015. Two Samsung affiliates merged uh, and a lot of people, prosecutors accused uh, of him and Samsung executives to really kind of engineer the you know, illegal move uh, to help his uh, succession, facilitate his succession. Um, he's a third generation leader of Samsung. So this has been um, going on uh, three and more than three years. Uh, the trial, there have been more than 100 trials 
trials on this case, of which I think he attended 97 trials himself. So this has been uh, a huge uh, shackle on Samsung because, um, you know, they have to really clear this, uh, this uncertainty. And now um, in November, prosecutors uh, in, in their final ruling said, um, you know, they were actually seeking for a five-year jail term. Um, and, 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 and a fine. So today is really a crucial day for Samsung because the low court, uh, the Seoul Central District Court, is going to make a ruling uh, on this case that had been going on for three years. Um, expectations are, you know, varied. Um, if it's cleared, that that's going to be really great news for Samsung. But there is a chance that you know the pro, uh, the, the the court may, um, you know, rule five-year jail term, for example. Then he will have to go back to jail. Um, other scenario is that he will be, uh, he may be able to um, avoid the jail term uh, if the, the, the judges uh, announce a suspended term, such as maybe less than three years, then he will be able to avoid going to the jail. Yeah, I'm interested in that scenario of a suspended sentence. Does that mean that he could continue to, to lead the company or be in a position of leadership? What are the, if and if he is sent back to, to jail, what does, what's the significance of that then? Sure. Uh, suspended sentence means that he will be able to avoid the jury term and he will be able to run the company. Um, but there, are, this is not the end. There is a chance that prosecutors may appeal. Um, and if, uh, if the, the outcome is bad for Samsung, Samsung will obviously appeal uh, again. Uh, so there is a chance that this could go to the next uh, court. So we don't know, but if he gets a suspended sentence, that would mean that he will be able to uh, lead Samsung at this pivotal time. He has said um, in November when the prosecutor sought five-year term, he has consistently uh, denied wrongdoing and asked for, um, really pleaded the court to give him a chance to lead Samsung because, you know, these three years of uncertainty has really took a toll on the, on the entire group. Uh, for example, SK Hynix, which is a small rival, has really used its time to accelerate uh, development of their uh, next, next, you know, stage advanced uh, chips. So, you know, a lot of analysts that we spoke to uh, think that that um, has really uh, affected Samsung in a negative way. And if he is able to avoid this jury term, he, he will be able to, to lead and that would be a great news for Samsung. That was our Asia Technology senior reporter, Yulim Lee, Yulim Lee there. Very, uh, something we're going to track very closely. But coming up in the next hour, more market analysis with City Global Wealth Investments, head of APAC Investment Strategy. Plus, Credit Agricole tells us why they expect a bumpy path ahead for China's growth.